Hi, happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, welcome to Animal Adaptations or Awesome Adaptations uh, with our friends here from the Ohio Division of Wildlife. I have with me Meredith Gilbert, and Meredith's going to be helping me today with questions. Um, and I'm Alyssa Yaple, by the way. Uh, so you can ask questions in the Q&A box. Please utilize it to um, ask us anything that you are wondering about uh, adaptations of the stream and river creatures that we're going to hear about today. And Jamie Emmert is with me. And Jamie is going to be our presenter talking about these awesome adaptations of uh, the creatures in our rivers and streams around Ohio. So um, thanks for joining us. And I will just hand it over now to Jamie to start her presentation. Thank you, Alyssa. I'm going to switch screens now. Can you see me? Um, I don't see the PowerPoint yet, but I see you. OK, so I'll just do a quick intro before I pull up the PowerPoint. And I really appreciate everybody tuning in today. And thank you, Alyssa and Meredith, for helping me present this program this morning. This is very exciting. I love talking about wildlife and I must because I've been in this position for 17 years now. And this is a lot of what I do is sharing the world of wildlife with Ohioans. And I also talk to reporters about news stories and I write news releases and articles for our Wild Ohio magazine and I conduct programs around the state. I set up displays at various events under normal circumstances. And so I have a wide variety to my job, but this is definitely the fav my favorite part. So without further ado, we'll jump into learning about river and stream creatures. All right. Bear with me a moment, please. How's that look, Alyssa? It is, it it's is a good. Slight, good. slight delay. Yeah, I, think I see it now though, we're looking good. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so we're going to cover a few things in a very short period of time. I'm, I'm gonna try to keep it this under 40 minutes. And I ask that Alyssa and Meredith keep me on track because otherwise I'll just go all morning. And I don't mind, but I'm sure you have better things to do, spend all day lis listening to me blab about wildlife. So we're gonna cover what an adaptation is and what a habitat is. And if you've tuned into our other programs, you already know the answers. So you're gonna be an expert by the time this is all said and done. And if you haven't tuned in before, then welcome. And we'll cover those definitions briefly. We'll talk specifically, of course, about river and stream ecosystems why humans and wildlife need these important ecosystems, adaptations of some specific species that I've selected that I really enjoy. There's such a long list of species that will use these ecosystems and depend on these habitats, but I selected a few that I think are some of the coolest. And then we'll talk about calls to action and how we can help continue to protect these important spaces and the wildlife that lives there. So think about what an adaptation is. How would you define or describe an adaptation of a wild animal? Does critter come to mind? <laughs> now this isn't a critter that lives in Ohio, I assure you. This frogigator or this allofrog, I don't know what you want to call it, um, but this is just a photoshopped version of what a frog would look like if you combined it with an alligator. So this is a very strange sort of adaptations, um, but as you can see, it's an alligator head on a frog's body. Uh, so just a little bit of fun, but think about when you look at this picture, what are some features of this animal that you think might help it survive in its habitat? So is it the teeth or the long snout or those big eyes? Or look at those long toes, perfect for gripping. There's some all kinds of neat features about this animal that might help it survive if in fact it really existed. 
But regardless if that creature is real or not, the adaptations are real. So the adaptations are characteristic, like something that, that you see when you look at the animal, for instance, a physical characteristic that helps it survive. So this might be a body part like the toes, body coverings like this smooth skin that has a protective, a little bit of a protective slime, or a behavior like the fact that this Frog, these frog legs allow this animal to jump great distances, maybe to evade a predator. So regardless of what the adaptation is, some animals have many, some have just a few, it helps them to survive in their habitat. So the question is then, what is a habitat? You think about it for a second. How do you describe the word habitat? So it's a home of an animal, a plant, even bacteria, as small and maybe as insignificant as bacteria might seem, they need a place to live too. And this, regardless of how cold it might look, it doesn't look like the preferred habitat for me in this picture. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not too uh, adapted for cold environments, but this is an important home for many, many creatures. And if you like cold weather, then this is a great home for you too. What are some of the features of a good habitat where an animal can comfortably survive? There's four basic elements and in no particular order, think about what those elements are. What do you need to survive? You too, wild animals are the same way. Did you think about all these elements? Food, water, shelter, and space. So food to fill your bellies, water to replenish you, shelter in the, the form of a roof over your head, or in this case, vegetation or water is that shelter that some animals need. And then space is something that we often take for granted. But people and wildlife alike, we need space to be comfortable and to survive, especially if we're living in a home with lots of brothers and sisters. We need our space. So within a habitat, and in this particular case, we're talking about rivers and streams, so water ecosystems, we're, we need to talk about watersheds. And a watershed is everywhere. So everybody lives in a watershed. If you look at this map, you'll see that there are two watersheds in the state of Ohio. So do you know where you live? Can you look closely at that map and get an indication even of where you are on this map? Just maybe think about regionally. Do you live in Northeast Ohio like I do? I live in Akron. Or do you live in Southwest Ohio by the Ohio River? So if you can get an indication if you're down here in the southern part of the state, maybe by Shawnee State Forest, you're down here. Can you see my cursor? Okay, and I'm up here in Akron. So I'm in the Lake Erie watershed. So the water drains from Lake Erie. It runs north to Lake Erie. Where if you're in the Columbus area, for instance, and south of there, the water runs south to the Ohio River. Ohio has 24 watersheds. So those are smaller watersheds. We have two major watersheds, big watersheds, Lake Erie and Ohio River, and 24 smaller watersheds. So you see this list, these are all the watersheds. So if you can, this is a little bit trickier, try to, to zoom in on with your eyes, look at the map here and try to find where you are. So again, I'm in the Akron area. And if you look really closely, lean in, and you can see the word summit by my cursor. It's really tough to see, so you might have to squint, but over the word summit, you'll see a blue line labeled the Cuyahoga River. So I'm really close to the Cuyahoga River, and you see number five right here? That's Cuyahoga River. So if you can't read the small, the small writing on the, the rivers, you can see that the number correlates, and the number the bigger the number, the bigger the watershed. So if you look down here, if you're in the new Philadelphia area, if you're northeast of number 14, for instance, then you're by the Muskingum River. And this is a big watershed, so it's expansive. It cover, covers lots of area, and that's why the number 14 is so big. Same with number 21. If you're in central Ohio, you may be closely associated with the Scioto River. Does that all make sense? 
So just try to find yourself on this map. So Alyssa is in central Ohio, right? And Meredith is in northwest. So you can point. I can't see you pointing, but go ahead and try to find where just roughly where you are and point to the number that's closest to where you live and you can get an idea of what the minor watershed is near you. All right, we're going to move on. And a common question I get when I talk about habitat, especially associated with water, is, well, what's the difference between a stream and a river and a creek or a creek? If you're from where, where I am in Southeast Ohio, my family calls it a creek. And a brook is another word that you might hear that references streams and rivers. So a stream is a very general term. If you call a river, a creek, or a brook, a stream, you're right, no matter what. It's just a very broad term. So it's it describes water that flows along a defined path, like you're hiking out on a trail. That trail is a defined path that you're taking. River is a stream that exceeds 100 miles, where a creek is smaller than a river. So it's less than 100 miles, and that's very rough. And then a brook is just another general term for a very small stream. Maybe it's very skinny and narrow, not real long. So just some crash course on how to use the terminology. So everybody loves fun facts, right? And this is some interesting stuff. We have over 61,000 miles of streams here in the Buckeye State. That's impressive. So we have lots of water flowing through our state, which is great. Only 3,300 or so are actually named for various reasons. Maybe they're significant enough that we've named them or they're just so small that it's just too difficult to name all those really tiny ones. But, but 3,300 actually have labels to them. And streams are used for very many different reasons. So there's a broad term that we use in ODNR, and that's recreation. And that means to enjoy the streams through maybe using a kayak or using a canoe or swimming, maybe fishing. We also use these waterways for electricity, for drinking water. It's filtered before it gets to you. Wastewater treatment for farms and industry like factories. So water is very important to humans and wildlife alike for very uh, various reasons. So the scenic river law was passed in 1968 and that protected these waterways to make sure that the habitat is protected and the wildlife there is protected endlessly as, to, as well. So another question I have for you is what is a riparian area? Have you ever heard that word? Riparian or riparian zone maybe? This is the area of habitat along a waterway. So it might be influenced by a couple of different things. Maybe the type of habitat, if there's a lot of trees, it means it's really shaded and then the water is cooler, which is good for some species like trout. If it's near farm fields, it may be affected by sediment, which is soil and runoff. So it's important to have some vegetation along those areas, along that riparian zone to prevent soil from running into the water because that's not necessarily good for wildlife. And if it's in urban areas, there's all sorts of factors like maybe runoff from roads. So it's important to have a, a big riparian zone of habitat to protect the water and the soil along those streams. Water quality can vary from one stream to another for lots of different reasons. So you might have really clear water and natural habitat and a lot of species because it's highly oxygenated water, very clean, but low quality streams are not good for wildlife. And this means that maybe the riparian zone was removed, that buffer that runs along the stream that protects the water has been removed maybe for development and that's not good. And that's an important part of the Scenic Rivers Law and that's why it was enacted in the 60s is to protect that habitat so that the stream is protected too. So we want lots of wildlife using these streams and with lots of wildlife, we want a diversity of habitat and healthy trees and healthy vegetation. Hope that makes sense. If I'm moving too fast, Alyssa, just let me know. 
So how many species of wildlife use our rivers and streams? Would you believe it's over 1,400? And most of that number includes bugs. Bugs are so important. I get that question a lot from folks. They ask me, well, bugs are so small and I don't really ever see bugs too often. And when I do, they're bugging me. Well, are they important? And they're so important. They're especially important as a food source for many species. So of that 1,400 species that depend on our waterways, 1,200 being insects, 75 species of mussels depend on the food chain and use our rivers and streams, over 160 species of fish, 10 reptiles, most of them being turtles and a couple of snakes, queen snake and water snake. And then we have 14 species of amphibians, most of them salamanders and a couple of species of frogs. And then I can go on for hours about the species of birds that depend either directly on a water source, on the water sources in the form of streams and rivers, and indirectly that maybe they just visit to get a quick drink or to clean up. And this includes ducks and herons and eagles and osprey and swallows and kingfishers and the list goes on and on. We have hundreds of birds living in the state of Ohio. Over 400 have been recorded and many of them depend on our rivers and streams to live comfortably. And mammals too. The list of, of mammals is long, but some species that might immediately come to your mind include muskrats and beavers, river otters perhaps, raccoons like being near water, and they'll use ponds. A lot of these species will use ponds and lakes too, but that moving water makes them happier because it's so full of life and they just like the sound of moving water so they're attracted to that sound and so it's good to have a variety of different water sources so rivers and streams are equally as important as lakes so i mentioned that i specifically chose a few species to highlight today and since we looked at we talked briefly about insects and mammals and birds and fish and reptiles and amphibians I picked one species to represent each of those groups and it was tough because there's so many to choose from but I have some personal favorites so hopefully you understand why I chose these over others when I tell you a little bit more about each of them so this slide represents a really beautiful and very common damselfly that we have here in the Buckeye State. Damselflies are similar to a species that you may be more familiar with, which is dragonfly, but they hold their wings differently in most cases. Some species of dragonflies will lay their wings flat when they're at rest, where damselflies hold them against their bodies. So it changes from one species to the next, but that's generally a good way to determine if you're looking at a dragonfly or a damselfly. And damselflies are smaller than most dragonflies. They're very skinny and petite. So you can see in these pictures that this particular jewel wing, this ebony jewel wing, is a really beautiful damselfly. Look how glossy it is and how colorful it is. And you can probably understand why it gets its name, the jewel wing. And this is in the top left corner of the slide, a picture of when it was a baby. So this is called a naiad or a nymph. There's a couple of different terms for a, referring to a baby damselfly. Look at that camouflage. If that is an excellent, if that's not an excellent adaptation, I don't know what is. This is sediment along the bottom of a waterway. They like moving water and it blends perfectly well with this sediment or this sandy soil at the bottom. And they cling on to the soil and the rocks and they eat tiny little insects, even smaller than them, and they're really tiny as it is. And then after a few years of living this way, strictly underwater, they will emerge and like a caterpillar and a butterfly, if you know the cycle between a caterpillar and a butterfly, it's relatively similar in the fact that eventually out of the shell of this baby damselfly emerges an adult damselfly. The wings will dry out and it will fly off. So that's lots of cool adaptations about the jewel wing, but the camouflage is pretty darn cool as well as how these animals lay eggs. If you look in the bottom right hand corner, do you see the picture of the two jewel wings on the leaf? So this is a female on the bottom and you can see her body is bent down and touching that leaf that's just ever so slightly submerged in the water. She's laying eggs. 
using an organ called an ovipositor. Can you say that with me? That's a mouthful, right? Ovipositor. So she lays eggs in the water on the surface of, of submerged vegetation and eventually those eggs will emerge and then the cycle starts with this naiad or this nymph and then eventually the adult will emerge. So very, very cool stuff. Ready to move on? We have still lots to talk about. Let's talk about mussels, but not this kind. <laughs> we have some other mussels and these are freshwater mussels. And this picture is kind of silly, but it's very representative of the importance of mussels in our water systems. So if you look at this illustration, you see a mussel holding a vacuum over here and running a vacuum on the floor of the waterway. This one is holding a mop and mopping up the waterway. This one over here on the right hand side has a little broom and dust pan and we have some fish watching. And these are grateful fish because these mussels are working hard to improve their surroundings. They are the powerhouses of our waterways. They filter water and make it really clean. So they are so important to an ecosystem. And these are pictures of mussels that can be found in Ohio. And if you see a mussel in the bottom of a waterway, you're maybe walking through some knee deep or ankle deep water and you look down and you spot some mussels along the bottom. Don't touch them because they're pretty fragile and they just leave them alone to do their thing. But realize that you're in a really clean waterway. This is a great sign because they are pretty intolerant of dirty water, of sedimentation, maybe runoff from local farm fields, for instance, or pollution from chemicals that were accidentally dumped in the water. They don't tolerate that stuff very well. So if you see a freshwater mussel, that means that you're in really clear water. And mussels are just cool because they have the coolest names. If you look up information about freshwater mussels, you'll see names like purple cat's paw and warty back, pig's nose. There's one called a heel splitter, which sounds kind of scary, but it's just because they are the way that they're shaped. And so they have some really fun names. So they're not the most charismatic animal in our ecosystem here that we're talking about, but that's because they're just staying along the bottom of the waterway out of our sight most of the time, but conducting very important business. They have lots of cool, ad cool adaptations. And if you look at the pictures here, you'll see in this top right corner picture, for instance, look at how well it blends in. We talked about the nymph for the damselfly and mussels can camouflage themselves so well too because they're an important food source for many species of critters like herons and raccoons and river otters so they need to blend in in order to protect themselves and don't they just kind of look like rocks along the bottom so that's a cool adaptation of physical characteristic but let's watch a video hopefully it plays everybody cross your fingers there's a little bit of a delay, so just be patient with me, please. But we're gonna watch a really neat video, maybe not the whole thing, but we're gonna see something very cool in action and I'll let the video do the talking. In the streams of Missouri, live the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task, as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. Oh. 
On impact, the mussel squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills, like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay, drawing blood from the fish, until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed mussels. All right, we're gonna stop right there. And I'm gonna try to move on. So we're not gonna watch the whole video because we're just trying to keep moving along, but you can Google it and look up uh, freshwater mussel catching bass or catching fish perhaps and see the video again. But isn't that cool? Isn't that the coolest? I don't know why. <laughs> I can't move on now. Maybe if you stop sharing quickly and then just try and share again, do you think that would work? Or? It's doing something. OK. There we go. All right. So yeah, if you look up um, freshwater mussels and bass, then you can learn more. And the, the bass isn't hurt. The fish isn't hurt. It would actually do the mussel a disservice to hurt the fish because it needs the fish to stay alive and and carry those young. So ultimately it's going to be tough on the fish because now it's responsible for a bunch of lives instead of just its own, um, but it will be fine in the end. Pretty neat stuff though, right? If that isn't a cool adaptation, I don't know what is. Let's move on to one of my favorite fish of a water, of a river and stream ecosystem. And this is flathead catfish. And you'll see that there's three pictures of the same guy, and that's my colleague, Cameron. He works out of the Akron office for Division of Wildlife too, and he is a fish biologist. But he's also a fisherman. He loves to fish and he loves to fi fish for flathead catfish, which is why I have all these pictures of him and his friends and our colleagues. And they're the biggest fish that lives in river and stream ecosystems. They can get huge. I mean, look at that bottom middle picture of Cameron. He's almost six feet tall and he's holding that fish up to his chest and it's still laying on the ground. Its tail is still laying a little bit on the ground. That's impressive. They they just get enormous and they have this beautiful olive color to their bodies. They spend a lot of time, like most catfish, along the bottom of the waterway, just like freshwater mussels. They're often out of our sight. They like to live in logs and in hollow logs or under rocks and they will ambush their prey. That means that they will just lay in wait quietly and still until maybe another fish happens to swim by and they very quickly are able to, to fly out from underneath that rock or log, swim out really quickly and snatch up that fish. And look at that mouth in the top right hand corner. You see that picture of its face. Look how big that mouth is. If you can imagine it opening up, they can eat pretty big stuff and they have to the bigger they get. When they get as big as the one in the in the bottom middle picture there, they have to eat some pretty significant um, animals or or a lot of animals in order to sustain themselves. They're not real active since they lay in wait so much, but they still have to sustain themselves. And look at those tiny little eyes. They don't have to see really well because they have excellent sense of smell. They can see a little bit. They can see shadows and movement, but their stronger adaptation is actually these whiskers. And this is probably familiar to you if you've ever seen a catfish of any species up close. These barbels or whiskers are they work just like on a house cat. They help them get a sense of feel. They're very sensitive. And instead of relying so much on eyesight like humans do, they'll move around the bottom of a waterway and feel around with these whiskers. So the whiskers aren't poisonous. If you happen to touch a catfish whisker, it's not going to hurt you. They're actually really, really soft and they're very sensitive and important to catfish and their well being. So we've covered insects and we've covered mussels and we covered fish. So let's move on to birds. And this is these pictures represent a Louisiana water thrush. In the top left corner is a singing adult. Look at that very bright white eyebrow and the stripes along its flanks and 
gorgeous pink legs. They're really striking small birds about the size of, of your fist, a little bit bigger, depending on how your fist is, but about the size of my fist. And they lay eggs along stream banks and they're really well hidden. These spectacled eggs are hidden in little hollow places along root systems, for instance, on exposed stream, stream banks. So that's the, you see the eggs in the top middle picture. And then if you move to the right, the top right picture, you'll see there's a little tail sticking out from a hollow, from a cavity in the stream bank. And, and that's the female going into the, the, the nest. She's visiting her nest, checking on the eggs. Very well hidden nest. So another picture in the bottom left, you can see those pink legs stand out and this helps them to attract mates. It's very unique looking. They're unique looking birds compared to many other songbirds. But what is very cool about their adaptations is their song. They live near these waterways and moving water can produce a lot of sound. So when they have to call to announce their territories, like any other bird species, they call for many different reasons to, to say that this is my space and it's already taken, so find another space. They may be talking to, one male may be talking to another male to say, this is my space, not yours. Maybe it's calling to attract a mate and to attract a female because they want to nest there. Uh, might be sounding an alarm because there's a predator nearby and it's warning other birds that there's something nearby that they don't want there. So they call for very different reasons, but they have to have a pretty significant call in order to overcome the sound of the water. So let's listen. So you may have to cup your ear or tune up the volume, turn up the volume. But keep in mind, listen to how loud the water is. It's Jamie, pretty... we can't hear the, um, we can't hear the sound. Oh, really? Because there's an error. Oops. I can play it on my phone, that's okay. Could you see the video? Yeah. Let's try again. Sorry about that. Could you hear the video for the muscles? Okay. Yeah, I could hear that. Oh, it turned it off for some reason. Just a small technical malfunction we will overcome. So instead of playing the video again, I will just play the call. But in the video, it, there was really loud rippling water. And it, as it's falling over the rocks, small waterfalls create the splashing sounds. And it, it's hard for a bird to overcome the, all that sound of moving water. But Louisiana water thrushes can do it. Can you hear that? And they have some variations. So it's very warbly, high pitched call. And and for a tiny little bird the size of your fist thereabouts, it has some pretty serious pipes. So this bird has adapted to be able to sing and overcome the sound of moving water where it prefers to be and where it prefers to nest. All right. Now let's talk about reptiles. And this is in no specific order, no specific order to the importance and value of the animal or, or my favorite, I just picked random order. So now we're moving on to talk about spiny soft shell turtles. And aren't these neat looking animals? They are just incredible. They look like pancakes in a way because they have these super round disc shaped shells that are very leathery. So very different than you maybe you're familiar with a, a snapping turtle or a, a box turtle. They have really hard shells that protect the organs and protect their bodies. And so these animals living in the water, they don't have necessarily need that protection like terrestrial animals, like the terrestrial 
box turtle. So they're just adapted to different circumstances. So this leathery skin is still really tough. So it does still protect them from predators and abrasions to some extent. So that, but it helps them this, whoops, I bumped it. This soft leathery shell helps make them more fluid in the water. It allow, allows them to swim really fast. And this helps them to be able to chase down prey like fish and, and tiny, tiny little minnows and then larger fish too. That's some of their favorites. They'll eat bugs and snails and things too that they can get a hold of, but they especially like fish and they have excellent senses of smell. And what's most impressive to me is if you look in the bottom right hand corner or the top, right hand corner see uh, look at how long these necks are they can stretch their necks out as they're chasing through the water and they're swimming really fast they can extend that neck out and grab their prey with lightning speed they're like watery ninjas and they're able to snatch up their prey so they're really efficient predators um, and look at that nose, isn't that unique? That's just a very odd adaptation to help it move through the water and to smell well. And they have specialized skin, and this includes their shell too, I believe, that leathery shell to let them to breathe underwater. They can't breathe underwater forever. They can't just stay underwater without ever coming up for a breath, but they can do it up to seven months long. And this is during hibernation in the winter. This is an adaptation they have that's unlike the Louisiana water thrush, for instance. That water thrush has wings and feathers that allow it to fly, of course. And it has the smart idea of flying down to Florida or even further south to Mexico or Panama and Central America and migrate when the weather gets too cold. And in the, that southern climate, they can find food and they can withstand temperatures much easier where the turtle can't just fly away. So it buries itself in the mud and can still breathe in that mud for up to seven months without ever coming up to the surface to get oxygen from the air. Absolutely fascinating. You hey, hear Jamie, my friendly blue that? jays? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was gonna ask you. Yeah, blue jays and crows are making quite a, a fuss right now. I'm not sure why, but we do have Cooper's hawks and red-shouldered hawks hang around. So I mentioned the water thrush will sound the alarm if it sees a predator and crows and blue jays are known for being the uh, eyes of the forest. So I wouldn't doubt there's not a predator nearby. Ready to move on to amphibians? We talked about several groups of animals, but we haven't covered amphibians yet. And these are animals that sometimes by their name can live on land as well as in water where reptiles are one or the other. Reptiles have uh, drier skin and scales and amphibians on the other hand have a different skin that actually allows them to breathe through their skin, kind of like the reptile spiny sock shell turtle. So you'll see some overlap there. But amphibians tend to live two lives. However, the mud puppy is a little bit of an exception. It spends its life in the water. So from when it's a baby in the bottom left hand corner, these are eggs and they're suspended from a wet rock and they will eventually hatch. And we have a tiny little mud puppy that grows into a bigger mud puppy and they can get as big as your forearm. And they're not real stout, but they can get long and especially that tail in the bottom right hand corner. Do you see that flat tail? It's very rudder like, like on a boat motor, and it helps them steer in the water. And in fast moving streams, they have to be able to steer really well in order to swim away from predators, to evade things that are trying to eat them, as well as to chase down prey, like small fish and other creatures. So they have to be really agile in the water. And they're so slimy that if you ever get the chance to hold a mud puppy, you'll be shocked. I've done it a few times and I cannot hang on to them. I will try to pick it up and hold it and it just slips right out of my hands. And that slime helps them to move so fluidly in the water and it protects them too from scratches and predator bites and helps them heal. Look in the top right hand corner at this cool picture of a mud puppy. And these are salamanders, by the way, aquatic salamanders. These are gills sticking out like fans around its neck from behind its head. You can see in the top left corner picture, 
you, you see those red gills and that helps it breathe. These are external gills and it helps and there the water is filtered through these gills and they're able to pull out oxygen to help them breathe underwater. Let's talk about one of my favorite aquatic mammals, and this is a favorite of lots of people because they're just so cute and fun and charismatic, and this is the river otter. And these are large creatures. They can get pretty stout and pretty heavy, and they're excellent predators. You can see in the picture in the top left, and as well as the bottom left, they have long tube-like bodies. You might be familiar with a smaller species that looks very similar, and that's called a mink. And they're aquatic too, to some extent, but river otters love being in the water. They spend a lot of time there eating mussels and crayfish and fish and other creatures. And then they'll come on, on land and play a lot. And they'll, they're very social, they live in family units. So when you see one, you'll probably see more. And they're just excellent swimmers. And this isn't this a cool picture in the bottom right? This is a, an otter swimming on its back. You can see its exposed belly and its tail it's over to the right hand side. They have really thick, strong tails. And just like that mud puppy, it helps them steer in the water. And so they're very agile swimmers from, for that reason. And they also have webbed feet. Like if you've ever seen a beaver foot or a muskrat foot or a duck foot, they have skin between their toes. But if you look closely at that bottom right picture or you see the track picture in the top right, you, you can see that there's not as much webbing as what you might be familiar with on beavers or ducks. There's just a little bit there because this allows them to be just as agile on land as in the water. So they have these little five little toes and a strong meaty foot pad. So if you see a track that looks like this, that's bigger than a quarter, it's probably river otter tracks and not mink tracks. And think about stride too. When you look at tracks, they have long strides because they have long bodies. So if the stride between the front foot and the back foot is say as long as your arm or half as long as your arm, it's too much length, body length, to be a, a smaller, similar species, which is mink. So something to keep in mind about seeing tracks, because oftentimes if otters hear you before they see you or before you see them, rather, they'll probably jump in the water and swim away. They tend to be pretty shy around humans. So oftentimes you want to look for the evidence of them and you'll probably be more likely to find the evidence in the actual animal. But they're throughout Ohio and the population continues to grow. So we really appreciate you being here today, learning about the wildlife adaptations of our rivers and stream ecosystems. And we encourage you to learn more and to protect these ecosystems. So support organizations that care about our important habitat here in Ohio, like Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Specifically, I represent Division of Wildlife. So please buy a hunting or fishing license, even if you don't hunt or fish. That money is so important to protect the critters that we talked about today and all the critters that we support here in the Buckeye State. And there's so many great organizations out there. So search for some organizations that speak to you and help support them. Share this important information with others. When others learn to care about this stuff, learn about this stuff, they learn to care about it too. And maybe volunteer when the opportunity presents itself down the road, maybe and volunteer to do citizen science and to collect data and make sure that our waterways stay healthy. So you can visit our website for more information about how to become a citizen science scientist at wildohio.gov. Or if you see that second link down, that's for the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. And we have a, a, a specific agency here in Ohio. Every state has a, there's a national level and then a state level. And then iNaturalist is one of my favorite applications that you can download on your phone and you can take pictures. So maybe you're out and you see an otter or you see an ebony jeweling damselfly and you can snap a picture with your phone and you can upload it to iNaturalist and contribute to inventories of wildlife and plants and, and bugs and all kinds of stuff. And then this is a long link and we'll share it with you maybe in the, the chat box, the Q&A box at the end so you can have that link or, or take a screenshot if you can take a screenshot 
um, off your computer. So this is a really neat guidebook, the Ohio Stream Guide. It's not in print anymore, I don't believe, but you can find a digital version at this link. So we'll share it again at the end, but if you Google Potomac Audubon, you might be able to find it, but this link will take you directly to the PDF. So if you want to learn more about the wildlife and the dynamics of how stream ecosystems work, this is a great document for that. And it's in color, it's really beautifully done. So without further ado, I'm going to wrap it up and we will uh, entertain questions for as long as we can. Hey, Jamie, you. can you buy a hunting or fishing license online? I think that especially with coronavirus going on right now and a lot of people, you know, being home, um, you know, how do you purchase one of those? Excellent question. Thank you. So you can go to wildohio.gov and you can do this from your desktop, from your laptop, from your iPad or your smartphone and purchase a fishing license, a hunting license. Um, even if you don't hunt or fish, that still goes to very important causes. But there's other options too. Our wildlife legacy stamp is available and that's a way to contribute and you get a really beautiful stamp and a sticker that represents that you support wildlife. So there's many different options, but if you go through wildohio.gov, it's really quick and it's easy and it only takes a couple of minutes. We'll create an account for you with the information that you provide and then we'll and then you can renew that every year and it's a great way to support wildlife in Ohio. Um, and then Tommy asks, what does a fish biologist do? You mentioned a fish biologist earlier. Yeah, yeah. So I work with several fish biologists as well as fish technicians. And a fish biologist goes through school, goes through college, and most of the fish biologists I work with, um, they like to stay local to home. Oftentimes in Ohio State University, the Ohio State University is a common place for fish biologists here in Ohio to get their schooling. And once they graduate with a master's degree and some even go on to get their PhDs, they will join different agencies that specialize in surveys and collecting data from fish populations. So the Ohio Division of Wildlife is one of those agencies. And I work with three biologists out of Akron who have gone to school and studied fish populations and then have been hired on to Division of Wildlife to go out to our different lakes and reservoirs and to Lake Erie and to the Ohio River and even really tiny stream tributaries too, little feeder creeks of larger streams. And they'll study the fish that live there and the other animals that live there too, because as I talked about earlier, it's important to know what bugs live in these streams because then these bugs feed a lot of the fish that live there. And so they will study to make sure that these populations are staying healthy and stable. And if not, work with other agencies to determine why the fish populations are suffering and how we can amend that, how we can fix that. And I, I mentioned in addition to biologists are fish technicians. And so the biologists work a lot with numbers. If you're really good with, with number skills and you're, you work well on the computer and you're very data oriented, then you, would, you could possibly make for a good biologist. But technicians do a lot of the field work too and they're out at doing all kinds of stuff. So in addition to assisting with surveys, they're doing a variety of other jobs. They may be working on signage to make sure regulations are posted or safety information is posted at parking lots. They might be mowing in order to keep habitats in check and to help manage our parking lots. They will be out in the dead of winter plowing our parking lots to make sure there's places for visitors to, to safely park. And so they have a big variety to their jobs. So it's it's just depending on what you're looking for. Um, and so Brock asks, uh, I found a crayfish in the creek behind my house. Does that mean that the water is healthy? Very cool. I'm glad to hear you're out exploring Brock then it's not necessarily the healthiest water just be, because you find a crayfish. Um, it's a good sign because they need to be able to breathe in that water and that means that there is oxygen in that water. Um, but depending on the species of crayfish, some will tolerate really healthy ecosystems and only where some species will tolerate less healthy. So 
it's maybe on a scale of one to 10, depending on the species, it might be a two or it might be an eight. It's hard to say. It just depends on what type of crayfish you found. But that means regardless that the water is clean enough for that animal to live there. And that's a good thing. Um, and why are zebra mussels bad? How did they get here? OK, that's a great question. So zebra mussels are an invasive species. That means that they're not native to Ohio or to North America. They've been introduced and ships come to Lake Erie from other parts of the world and they will sometimes be carrying species like zebra mussels. They've attached to the bottom of the ship and then they they disattach or release into our waterways and they and they can survive in Lake Erie and now they're in other reservoirs because they've attached to maybe a boat that was put in at Lake Erie and then taken out and, and taken to um, to Hoover Reservoir in central Ohio, for instance, and then those zebra mussels release from that boat into Hoover and now they're surviving. You'll see them on the columns of docks. Oftentimes they'll they'll collect there and live and they they actually, because we talked about freshwater mussels and how they filter water, that can be a good thing. But when there's such a huge population of a very efficient filter like zebra mussels, it cannot be such a good thing. And in Lake Erie, when I'm up there visiting, my friends will sometimes comment and say, wow, the water is so crystal clear and beautiful. Look how bright blue it is. I can see to the bottom. Well, that's not really necessarily a good thing. When you're at the beach and you can see the bottom, that might be the way it's supposed to be, and it is pretty, but that's not how Lake Erie is intended. It's actually intended to be a little cloudy that protects the bottom and the critters that live there and the, and the food that lives at the bottom, and the, the sunlight isn't intended to be able to reach down clear to the bottom of Lake Erie, but because of zebra mussels, the water is more intensely filtered than it would be if there were no zebra mussels, and we don't want that. So there are measures to try to remove zebra mussels to make the, the ecosystem more natural. So that's just a quick version of why ze we don't want zebra mussels here. Okay, and um, just two more questions and then I think we're gonna wrap it up because we're getting close to time. But um, Chelsea asks, uh, can I find the animals you talked about today near a city? I live in an urban area. Thank you, Chelsea. So it depends on the species, but I did try to pick species that are relatively common for the most part, but it's tough with aquatic creatures because so much of their time is spent in the water where you probably aren't, or unless you have a, a mask and a snorkel, you're probably not gonna see them really commonly like some creatures like a cardinal that lives in the tree next to your home. But um, the ebony jewel wings, the damselflies that we covered early on, they're very common along moving water, even slow moving water. So if you take a hike along a stream, keep an eye out because they, they'll be fluttering about in the, in the air and then they will perch on vegetation hanging out over the water. And so the, when they're on the wing, meaning they're flying around, that might catch your eye. And then you'll see them land and then they're pretty tolerant of you trying to creep up on them and get a closer picture closer look or take a pair of binoculars if you have a pair of binoculars handy and that'll give you an even better look but the chances of encountering an ebony jewel wing is fairly strong or damselflies and dragonflies for that matter um, they they this species likes moving water that we're talking about but many species like still water too so if you have a pond nearby you're likely to see a dragonfly i don't have water on my property here at my home and yet i have two species of dragonflies that like to hunt my flowers for bugs. And so they're, just because there's no water doesn't mean you won't see similar insects. As far as the mud puppy, they spend their time, and same with the spiny soft shell turtle, they spend a lot of their time at the bottom of waterways under rocks where they feel protected. So you're probably not gonna see one. The most commonly encountered mud puppies are actually by fishermen and fisherwomen. They will be fishing and all of a sudden get something on the line and reel in and discover that the salamander mud puppy has uh, gripped onto their hook. And so they release them and, and there's mud puppies can't hurt you. They're completely harmless. Um, just take them off the hook and release them back in the water. So if you do any fishing, you might find a mud puppy that way. Louisiana water thrushes 
Uh, they're here, especially in the springtime as they're migrating through Ohio. And that's when you'll most likely to, to see them is during spring migration and they're in larger numbers. They that call that singing that they do helps um, to hone in on where they are because they're so small and they're so well camouflaged that they they don't stand out very well. But watch the if you're at, say, the Mohican River, I see a lot of them in the springtime. So if you can visit Mohican State Forest, walk along the, the trail that that runs parallel to the river and you'll see them bouncing and hear them singing along the, the river system there. So if you can find a, a pathway that, that runs parallel to a healthy water system, then you might just see a water thrush. Um, and flathead catfish, flat, they're again, they're mostly encountered by fishermen or fish biologists because they spend so much time in the water. So, but you'll see if you are, if you stand on a bridge and look down over the water or you're standing ankle deep in the water, you're going for a creek walk, just stop every so often and stand very, very still because sometimes the fish will come back because they think that the, the predator is gone. They're seeing you as a predator. So if you walk into that water and then just stand very, very still and watch the surface of the water, you'll probably see all sorts of minnows and other strong, small stream fish come up to inspect your feet. So just be patient and I bet you'll see some fish. Okay, and last question and um... Ariel asks, what do mud puppies eat? Oh, it's a great question. They eat eggs from other salamanders, I believe. They eat fish. They probably eat some snails. So they're pretty opportunistic, which means and a lot of animals are that way. That means that they'll eat about anything they can get a hold of. And so if they're able to capture it, they're going to try to eat it. All right. Um, well, thank you, Jamie. And thank you, Meredith. And um, Let's see, I just want to follow up on, Jamie talked about uh, freshwater mussels. So I wanna challenge you, if you're watching this, I challenge you to research freshwater mussels. And she mentioned they have some cool names. So let us know what your favorite is. You can tag um, either at Ohio DNR or the Ohio Division of Wildlife on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And let us know your favorite and why. Is it because of the cool, funky name or is it because of one of its awesome adaptations? Um, we'd love to know. And then if you wanna check out more from our friends at the Division of Wildlife um, in this series about adaptations, uh, you can find the videos, they'll ar they're archived on our YouTube page and that's um, Ohio DNR and available there as well as uh, our friends from the Geological Division of Survey and their series on fossils and our friends from Parks and Watercraft and their series on pollinators. So check that out and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.